you hear from my accent that I'm originally from Trinidad. Left Trinidad in 1968 and uh, came to this beautiful country. And um, I'm, I'm 77 years old, uh, 77 years young, uh, so to speak. And um, I have been in this country long enough that I have kind of lost touch with the Caribbean, but yet I'm, I'm in love with the Caribbean. I try to go back as often as I could. And, um, but uh, the United States have taught me a few things that um, the, I am fascinated by the immigration situation, uh, how God has moved people into this country and the challenges that immigrants face with respect to um, not just assimilation, but more so in terms of bridging the gap and trying to understand what God is doing in, in, in other cultures. So I spent uh, quite a few years uh, pastoring different churches. And of course, the Church of the Nazarene is my background. Um, that's where I spent most of my time. I am now with the uh, Community Missionary Baptist Church in, here in Texas. And um, I'm really excited to be a part of this uh, Epps School of Ministry. And I hope that in this class particularly, we will be open and uh, you will be challenged. There are a lot of things that you might not agree with, and that's all right. Um, my objective is not to teach you what to think, but to teach you how to think. Okay? <laughs> Uh, not what to think, you don't have to agree with everything in this class, but at least if by the end of this course, you, um, you know how to navigate the different cultures, I think we would have accomplished uh, what this class is all about. So that's, that's where I am, that's who I am, and I, I love you all, and um, I, I trust we'll have a great time. So, okay, um, Catherine, if you will, just run through the syllabus for us and and explain all of that for us, if you will. Okay, and then some of it, of course, I will need your help uh, to right. explain. That's all right. Okay, but the, the syllabus uh, is uploaded in our Canvas and all of you have been sent an email inviting you to Canvas. And when you get the email, there's a little button that says start here. When you click that button, it'll take you to Canvas and say, you've been invited to this course, and then you have to accept that. And once you accept it, you'll be able to see what I see. It'll come up with the syllabus. So here's the, the course description uh, of what the syllabus about is about. And um, Oliver has put in his objectives, the required textbooks. All of these are found in our student resource library. And if you don't know where the student resource library is on the school website, I'll walk through that in just a second. Mm -hmm. But on the academic menu uh, on the website, which is www.fschoolofministry.org, if you go to academic menu, on that you'll see student resources. So all of the books um, written by, these were written by Dr. Oliver Phillips. So now I'm not sure if that's the same Oliver Phillips in this class or not, but, <laughs> um, but these are the three books that are required reading. And as he says here, there's additional reading that he'll assign from time to time. Um, the course vision statement, uh, educational assumptions, and all, I'm not gonna read all of this. You guys can read it when you go to Canvas. Of course, we know that preparation and class participation, um, we're, we're on our honor system, um, and anything else that, you know, you, information you need. I will quickly go over the grading. The written class assignment, uh, Dr. Phillips and I have got to get some more details to you for, for what that actually is. Uh, and then I'll upload that information. Of course, attendance and participation, and the final paper, that will be due the last day of course. He said the final paper will be a presentation. And once you get past the grading system, you will see the schedule of what we're doing tonight, 
what's coming up each night. So you'll, if you do miss, you can go to the recording that we do of each class, which is on the school YouTube website. And then you can see here, um, the final class is when the presentation is due. Presentation of essays on that final, that final Thursday. And let me, um, let me go stay, stay right there uh, with the final paper. Um, here, right, right there. Stay right okay. there. Now, in the course, in a in a couple more sessions, there are those two things we will spend a lot of time with. Is the universal value dialectic? Well, where we are. Oops. Where did she go? Um. The I'm sorry. <laughs> right. The universal value dialectic, and we will we will explain that you your final paper will either be on the universal va value dialectic or on the CQ quadrant. Those are two terms that you need to keep in mind, because and we will we will get into that. But it will be your choice either to do a paper on the universal value quadrant dialectic or on the CQ quadrant and that don't worry about it now we'll we'll cover that but keep those things somewhere in the back of your mind um some of you if you want to pray about it pray about it but it's what a one of these two that you'll get a chance to to do on go ahead Kathleen. okay i'm sorry I'm, i was just going to the the school for a second yeah mm -hmm. but i forgot you guys could see when i do that <laughs> but this is the ep school of ministry website and um, you probably saw it if you went to register, you saw some portion of it. But this is the academics menu and student resources is here on the academics menu. If you scroll down, you'll see resource library. In the resource library, any of the books that are there, you're welcome to read those anytime that you want. But the ones that are referred to in the syllabus are here um, at the end. The E Pluribus Unum, The Elephant in the Room, um, Don't Christianize the Culture. Um, so those are right here. So again, I'll, I'll just go uh, back. Let me go back home mm -hmm. and just walk through that again. When you're on the home page, if you just go to the academics menu, go to student resources, scroll down to resource library and this is where you will find those books so i thank dr phillips for this because that keeps us from having to go out and buy books okay uh, the, the elephant in the room um we have hard copies barbara tidmore and dawn will get your copies on saturday in the workshop i have hard copies so at least you will get um those and um the other two folks we can mail you I, I think you 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 need to have a hard copy we we can mail it to saint lucia and um uh, and, and of course we will we marlene you'll get your I, i'll make sure that you get a hard copy but you guys need to get a hard copy it's uh, it's um the whole idea of elephant in the room is that sometimes we don't want to talk about some issues and culture is like the elephant in the room. Right. And so when I wrote that book, I wrote it because of course I, I, I was dealing with a lot of white folks and um, sometimes they don't want to talk about these issues, but they talk it to themselves and right. under their breath. But there are some, there are some values and behaviors about culture that we will get into. Um, what, 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 is, what is cultural intelligence all about? Cultural intelligence is the ability to deal with people of other cultures considering, first of all, their values. And we will get into the, the, um, what, some of the terminologies that we can use in terms of describing culture. The one that I like most is like uh, culture is like a, a, a quilt. Uh, you know, uh, little pieces here and there. Culture is like a tree. Culture is like a computer, hardware and software. The one I like most is that culture is like an iceberg. Yes. 20% is at the top. And that's what we see. 
we see behaviors from people what we don't see uh is the 80 percent that's under the under the there that those are the values that people hold dear and if we don't understand the what what makes the 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 power of the of the iceberg we will miss it so we'll spend a lot of time considering the values that people hold dear and if we understand their values then we will understand why people talk the way they talk or they do a, a typical example is the illustration of a a young lady from america who went to one of the countries in africa and um the griot or the, the the old the old sage um as soon as she introduced her 12 year old son to him he spit in his hand and put it on the on the little boy's forehead <laughs> and of course not a big spit but you know the motion of but that's how they bless in that culture that's how they bless now if you don't understand that then you will Take your um, Dawn. I can see you taking your handkerchief off and wipe. <laughs> 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 and wiping your son's head. But these are the things that we have to understand. Right. Why people act the way they do, and that's what this course is about: understanding those basic things. Now, are you through, Catherine? Yes, sir. Are you? You through? All right, your your check is in the mail. Now, <laughs> if if we can if we can now, is there any question that anybody has about culture that you would like to ask before we get in the course? I I have a question, and you will yeah. probably cover this in the course. Mm -hmm. But I am always wondering when I meet someone of a different culture, if you don't know anything about their culture, what do you do? Do you just stick with your own or, or what, you know, that's, that's what I'm always puzzled by. Well, I don't know what to say or what to do. Great. And Great. Good. Well, this course will help you uh, in that. And um, it's, it's called CQ strategy. Um, um, the, the, the term, the, br the brief term is CQ uh, for cultural intelligence. Now, you know about IQ, Tidmore, um, IQ. Um, people don't improve their IQ. If, you, if you're a little child with a 34 IQ or 85 IQ, you, the rest of your life, you don't improve on your IQ. That's something that people don't improve on. Human resource always used to look for many, many years, used to look to hire people with a high IQ. And if they know that if they have a person with a high IQ, then the chances are of success are very good because they have a very high IQ. One of the persons, if we remember recently, one of the persons with a very high IQ was Bill Clinton. Um, he made his, a set of mistakes, but he was one. He was known as a person with a high IQ. However, beginning about 1950, between 1950 and 1960, they found out that there are a lot of people who have a high IQ, but on the job they seem not to be able to get along with other people for some reason. And the professionals and the scientists, they began putting their heads together and dealing with anthropology and all of that. And they, they came up with this, excuse the expression, when, when women got a little attitude on the job, we used to say, well, you know, it's that time of the month, you know. And so we excuse her, it's that time. Now, however, they found out that men were also facing the same challenges some men even with a high iq for some reason they get rattled very quickly out of that science and research came emotional intelligence which is eq and so that even with an hr departments even with persons with high iq 
they they knew that they had to teach them emotional intelligence how to deal with 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 their own emotions so that they don't blow up now so we have iq and we have eq right globalization began uh, to take place in the 70s where a lot of factories in america a lot of businesses in america were going overseas they were going to japan they were going to china they were going all these different places but what they found out is that even with managers with high iq and very good eq yet when they go to china they couldn't get along they couldn't make it and they were just calling managers back they would go and they would work there for two year two months three months four months and then they have to call them back they just could not get along with the people so out of that research came cultural intelligence mm. so you have iq which is intelligent quotient and then you have emotional intelligence and with globalization they they felt that people need to understand the culture and if you don't understand the culture you're going to end up frustrated and you're going to end up defeating your own purpose so that basically is what cultural intelligence is about how do you strategize to deal with individuals who have a different uh, culture than you are okay any other question would you categorize um people with intellectual disability in that same arena or yes that's mindset? a part of the that's a part of the iq and i know that's your area and um this is entirely different but some of the things we learn in cultural intelligence will help us with this so therefore as a as a sidebar to this there is also generational culture there is institutional culture there is uh age there is gender and so the, what we are dealing with particularly is is this culture uh, as as we see people of different cultures the for instance i i came into um community missionary baptist church in july of last year now i have spent a lot of years in institutions i spent 11 years in the headquarters uh, as the hnic for for 11 years and then and then i i came to community missionary baptist church well <laughs> I had to learn the institution. I had to learn what Community Missionary Baptist Church is all about. And if I didn't learn it, I'd be running into all kinds of problems. I have to deal with Tidmo. <laughs> but we understand that every institution has a culture. And our job as we get into an institution is to understand what makes it tick. So therefore, in this term, in this sense, when we talk about culture, we have to understand what makes people tick. People, uh, immigrants are coming from all over the world and they bring their values with them. And as, as much, remember, it used to be that it was said, America is a melting pot. Well, it's not. Mm -hmm. America is not a melting pot. We don't ask people to assimilate. But what we ask people is to be able to understand each other and why people do what they, what they do. And if we understand that, we'll be able to get it. So America is not a melting pot. Right. America is a salad bowl. Yeah. The tomato will always be a tomato. The cucumber will always be a cucumber. Mm -hmm. But what we have to understand is what is the dressing that brings it all together? And this, when we study cultural intelligence, we, we understand what is the dressing that we put and understand quite well that no matter how much dressing you put on that tomato, it will never taste like a cucumber. That's true. Because it's still, it's still that. So that's what this is all about so welcome to the world cool. of cultural intelligence and i trust that and we will have a lot of examples as we go along so 
share screen um, PowerPoint. Uh, you got it, young lady? No? I do not have it. I All checked right. my Gmail and it was too big. You got it. Look at yeah. <laughs> he, he can He can wing it. He knows it. He knows it. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Cultural Intelligence 210. This session deals with what is cultural intelligence or CQ and why is it important? We will understand the history and the evolution of it. The some 2013, I, I think it's 20, 2010, I was introduced first to this whole idea of cultural intelligence and I've been fascinated by it. This is my certificate of completion uh, in it. So, um, so that at least you know that my background in terms of this. I'm not just a, a minister of the gospel, but I also dabble with this. I've got a question to ask you. What do you see here? A zebra. Right. I what see a blank see? spot where the arrow is. How do I get this to move across? Um, let me see, where are you? You were on. Uh, I can't see at the bottom, but you should have something that looks like a little TV so that you can put it in slideshow. Yeah, see the little TV looking thing down yeah. at the bottom, yeah. way at the bottom? The TV looking thing on the right? Over. Again and again, there you go, right there. There we go. All right, is that better? Yes. All right, good. Yeah, what do you see here? One so zebra with a white mane, one zebra with a black mane, and one zebra with a, a black and a white mane. Okay. Anybody else, what do you see? One mane is finished, it's dark. The other one has stripes, and the other has it done. Okay. Now let's go. Roses and their mouths are different. Let's go to this one first. What, 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 what? If you had to describe this, what would you say in terms of color? What would you say it is? More of a whitish, or a like a white mane zebra. The left hand side, this one. Yeah, I would say too, it, it seems more like a white zebra with black stripes versus a black zebra with white stripes. Okay, so this but one- is black and white or a little grayish. This, this, this one is what? Black and white or white and black? Yeah. White, white and black. White, white and black. black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the one at the top? Black and white. Black and white. Black and white. <laughs> <laughs> because the black is the dominant color would you say the dominant color first mm -hmm. and this one he's mixed he's almost he's mixed he's not, yeah he's kind of yeah All but right. I would still put in black with white stripes All right, I, I, I brought this out because it it will our background will determine how we look at this mm -hmm. um the one at the top is a black zebra with white stripes mm -hmm. it's dominant black mm -hmm. the one on the at the bottom here what is this a white zebra a white zebra black, black, black stripes. stripes white zebra dominant white, white. right and this one, we will more or less say, is black and white or white and black. Mm -hmm. It seems as though the white and the black are evenly distributed. I bring this up mainly because it helps us to understand that as we look at people from different cultures, we see them differently. All right? And we have to understand that so that we will not be judgmental in the way we look at people you you look at an individual and you see them differently it depends on your background now most white folks they would look at this 
and they say it's definitely it's black and immediately that's a black person with a little bit of white <laughs> okay so i just brought this up to understand as a background that we all see things differently depending on our background okay now the next slide I don't know if you remember, uh, Tidmore, you, 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 you might remember this, uh, the, the, Who Moved My Cheese? I read that book uh, about <laughs> 24 years ago. Good. And it was a very interesting book. And uh, I, it, it was one of the most read books. Yeah. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, the author of the book passed away mm -hmm. not too mm -hmm. long ago. But uh, it was a very interesting short read and yeah. it's very insightful on how to adapt to change that's right and 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 the background to this is that they 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 had some mice or rat and they put them they had the cheese in one place and a few days for a few days the rat will come in and the rat knows exactly where the cheese is and they move the cheese and the rat that's not smart enough to know that the cheese has moved and the rat keeps going to the same place to get the cheese and the rat did not realize the cheese has moved. Same way in the uh, when it comes to Christianity, um, the cheese has moved. America is no longer uh, a place with one culture. Right. Uh, Christianity is not about one culture. The church of the 21st century will more resemble the church of the Pentecost as we saw in Acts 2. If we remember the story of Acts 2, it was people of different cultures. Lebanon, Cyprus, Malta, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Libya, all of them, different parts of Asia. What do we do in our communities when there are different people who want to be a part of the gospel as we know it? Our responsibility is to share the gospel with them. But if we don't understand how these people think, there is a barrier that is set up. Most people in America know that a thumbs up means, you know. <laughs> I went to a restaurant one time and I asked the, the waitress, um, how is the food? And she she just gave me a thumbs up, but I knew she was Asian. And I, when she came back, I said, could you do that at home? And she laughed. She says, no, I couldn't do that at home because in some cultures, a thumbs up means sit on this. Mm. <laughs> it's an insult. And so you have to know where you go, whether you're going to give a thumbs up if you don't understand the culture and somebody talks to you 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 give a, a thumbs up and really you're saying that, you know your food is not good the cheese has moved in our communities and if we don't accept the fact that the cheese has moved we will continue to do ministry the way we have always done it for instance I am um, in my responsibility in the Church of the Nazarene for many years. I was in charge of multicultural ministries. And I would go to white churches who shared their, their, their facility with Haitians. Um, and, you know, I, if I had to advise them, I would say, look, don't give them the nine o'clock spot. And some of these white folks would give a a Haitian church, nine o'clock, and tell them that they ought to be out by 1030 because the, the dominant culture is coming in to have their service. And I would say, no, you don't give Haitians nine o'clock because Haitians, the service is over when the service is over. And many times I would go and when I visit the church, some white person will meet me in the front and says, Dr. Phillips, could you teach them what time is? <laughs> they, you know, because they were struggling with the fact that even though they tell the Haitians, they are renting the property to them, but they would tell them, look, you need to be out by 1030. No, that's not the culture. The culture is, it's over when it's over. The, uh, uh, the, the Caribbean folks, Marlene and Anthony would understand quite well, um, 
for instance in in america you can ask when is the party going to be over and they'll tell you the party is going to be over three o'clock in the morning <laughs> but to the people in the caribbean you can't you can't ask that question when is the party going to be over no the party is over when the party is over wow and we have to understand how people think culturally in order to reach them how do we practice church amidst this new ecclesiastical climate immigrants have rezoned the church neighborhood how can the church respond res effectively in this type of climate so this is what this course is about how do we get people to uh, be a part of this Christian experience that God has called us to. And if we don't understand them, we cannot reach them. These are some statistics that I have, and it's a little dated, but it gives you a general idea of what America has become. There are more Jews living in America than in Israel. <laughs> That's startling more jews living in america than in israel more people of african descent live in america than any country in africa except nigeria now the sad part is that we have spent the the the, the dominant culture church has spent millions of dollars going overseas right. to reach other people and it is a it's a, it's a fascinating thing and and, 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 and the dominant culture always talk about the fact that we're going to Africa. We're going to take Jesus Christ to Africa. We're going to Mexico. But God has a good sense of humor. The same people who they have gone to reach, God has brought them here. Mm -hmm. and, and when God has brought them here, how do we do Christianity? How do we do church now that God has reversed it? There are more Samoans. Who live in America than in Samoa <laughs> and people missionaries study the culture before they go to Samoa but sadly the church in America has not studied the Samoan culture as to how to reach the Samoans because um, um, inherently they feel that Samoans must assimilate and Samoans must understand what it is to be american there are more hispanics live in america than any country except mexico and spain more cubans live in miami <laughs> except for havana wow. more armenians live in los angeles than any city in the world if we don't understand the culture of the armenians how are we going to reach them Right. In the 90s, in the USA, the Asian population grew by 107%, Hispanics by 55%, Native Americans by 38%, while the general population grew by only 6%. The burden for the church in America is to understand what missionaries learned a long time is that if they're going to go to the Caribbean, you better learn the Caribbean culture. We have, we from the Caribbean have something called carnival. And um, it's like Mardi Gras, uh, um, New Orleans kind of stuff. But I remember the days when um, the missionaries, when they came and they says, man, that's of Satan. We, 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 we invented the steel pan. And yet missionaries, when I joined the church in the 1960s, we, we couldn't have steel pan in the church because the missionary said it's of the devil. But they didn't understand. That's our culture. And if you're going to reach us, you must understand what makes us tick. These incredibly amazing demographics should awaken us to the challenge of becoming the New Testament church in the new century. So, for those of you from the Caribbean, you may not understand this little video. It's 10 minutes. Bear with me with this video. 
um, um, it's about baseball. Baseball has three bases, and um, first base, second base, and third base. But this is a little video of confusion that tells you what happens when people don't understand what you're saying. And conversely, when you don't understand what people are saying. Take a look at this video. In the book of Hebrews, uh, it gives us a good example. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Somebody read that. It's right on the screen. Somebody read it. What it says? There's the no other right one. one. Uh-huh. Yeah. <clears throat> what is it? The author of Hebrews connects the incarnation. Right. The long history of God contextualizing himself to his people in culturally intelligent ways. The author writes, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers at many times and in various ways. Thank you. Now, I, I want to use that <clears throat> as a foundation for our understanding cultural intelligence, that God has spoken at different times in different ways to different people. And if we understand that, God never tried to change the culture, but God got in the midst of this rather than cultural intelligence conflicting with Christianity or being merely a reflection of people talk about being politically correct. Christianity is the best foundation for understanding cultural intelligence. It is the best repository of cultural intelligence. There's no one right way for the gospel to be expressed. And if we understand that, that there are many different and meaningful ways to live out this Christian experience. So we, we the, come down a little screen. <laughs> so this orient, either directly or indirectly, we, we continue to hear Jesus say what you see on the surface of life is not all there is to life. Jesus lived this out. This Roman kingdom, and uh, uh, so we, we use the term kingdom. Jesus always got in trouble because of this kingdom. A lot of people didn't understand what Jesus meant by kingdom. Now, kingdom in our language is a bad word. We don't know what kingdom is. I, I always get in trouble when I tell people, I say, you know, this whole idea of the kingdom, Jesus lived in the days when they had kings. We don't have kings anymore. But yet we continue to use the term kingdom. So we want to look into the life of Jesus and see how Jesus dealt with this whole idea. He came and he met the term kingdom. But he understood what people meant by kingdom and he constantly got in trouble because he says, let me tell you what the kingdom really is. Their understanding of kingdom ran aground when it, in terms of how Jesus, under, when Jesus comes to earth, he enacts and embodies the kingdom of God wherever he goes and in whatever he does. One of the central points of discussion Evident in how Jesus described the kingdom is this term, and I would I don't know if you have heard this before, but this already not yet kingdom. One of the challenges for Jesus is that on the one hand, he accepted the kingdom that was here, and at other times it seems as though he is saying the kingdom is near. Understand that dialectic. Understand that struggle for the people. The kingdom is here, so it's what is called attention. Uh, and this is what cultural intelligence is all about. How do we deal with that tension? The kingdom is already present and embodied in Jesus' life, but yet he continues to say, the kingdom of God is like. So we understand this. Let's see how Jesus dealt with it. Um... Here it is. 
And this is what cultural intelligence is all about. It continues to show attention. So there are four words that we're going to deal with here. It's kingdom, word, deed, and culture. Okay? For the next uh, few minutes, well, half an hour or so. We want to deal with this. But notice the kingdom, the one at the top. The two arrows are going in different directions. The kingdom of God, but Jesus seems to say it's already here and it's not yet here. All right. So we'll, we'll deal with that tension because that's what cultural intelligence puts us in the midst of. And then there is this word and deed, which we call the incarnational ministry that Jesus introduced. But there was a constant struggle between word and deed between what people said and what people did mm -hmm. and Jesus constantly brought that to people's attention uh, your, 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 your deeds don't match up with the word all right so we'll we'll talk about that when it comes to culture on the one hand Jesus embraced the culture but on the other hand he protested against the culture and we'll deal with some of that so this is what is called the, the kingdom culture axis so those tensions we're going to deal with some of those tensions if we understand if we are to understand the the challenges of being multicultural these are the polarities and, and that we have to deal with the kingdom already not yet so let's deal with with the the first is the is the kingdom up here um i don't know where you, I, this is the kingdom um the king in it on the one hand jesus was always driving out demons by the spirit then the kingdom of god has come upon you is what jesus says in matthew 12 and 28 he declares the kingdom of god is within you well that's a little troublesome if the kingdom of God is already in you, how come he's saying that the kingdom of God is not here yet? What does Jesus mean by the kingdom of God is within you in Luke 17, 21? The royal power of God is already present in Jesus' words because those who repent already possess the kingdom. Isn't that confusing? Wow. That's what culture does. If we understand how Jesus navigated those polarities, we will understand how we deal with, 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 with culture. At the same time, Jesus doesn't fully release the power of the kingdom. It seems as though he, because evil is still present in the world, both then and now. Where is this kingdom? <laughs> the kingdom of God is with you. Oh, the kingdom has come upon you. Elsewhere, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Where? The kingdom of heaven could not be in you, and yet it's not yet. So that already and not yet tension is what we have to. And while in one breath, he says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the same breath, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for someday they will receive it in full measure. Jesus' work is already present while also moving in history toward the time when we will be made right. Any questions on this? Um, just a, a comment. Yeah. So I guess um, that, um, yes, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now, um, but I, I, I believe that there will be the fulfillment of the kingdom, which would um, come when Jesus returns to really lavish us um, with that kingdom, give us a kingdom to the full extent, to the full power. So the kingdom has not come. 
The kingdom is within you once you accept Jesus Christ. That's a confession of God glory, being glorified in you because we can accelerate that even the Holy Spirit that he promised that he mm. would mm -hmm. live in and through and by the Holy Spirit. So that is why he was able to say, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are persecuted. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus himself experienced those um, atrocities. So he expected that we too, but he's given us a hope. Mm -hmm. The hope is the kingdom like the uh, Anthony just said. It's the hope to come. But yet still we have it. We can end envelope it more or less knowing that we are empowered through it so jesus was able to be culturally intelligent culturally smart because he is presenting a dialectic yeah he is saying the kingdom is here but the kingdom is not yet mm -hmm. to understand people of different cultures you have to accept that dialectic but but yeah. Oliver, he was talking from a worldview. His father yeah. created the world. His father created him. And even when John the Baptist said he's the Lamb of God to come take away the sins of the world, so he wasn't speaking just for the Jews and the Gentiles. He was speaking for everybody that was, that was created. He had a bigger yeah. world purpose, and I think he kind of spoke to that. And he he got even in his parables, he was talking very general, and and he knew his audience when he was talking and teaching. He was saying. I'm here, I'm here for all nations. I'm here for, for all, all people. Mm, mm, you know, even our charge said, go go and teach all nations. Good. You know, we, we're not looking necessarily from just white and black and what language you speak. Good. There were Good. 12 Good. different tribes. Mm -hmm. So um, we just look at, have to look at it from a worldview, not just whether you're Protestant or Catholic. We all follow one person. Good. So you understand, you understand the confusion here as we deal with culture, that it is already and not yet, but we don't change that. We accommodate that and we understand. So that was the challenge for Jesus. The kingdom is here, but the kingdom is not yet. And to deal with that, he dealt with that in a very, very meaningful way. So if we understand that and we understand how Jesus accommodated that and lived between that, for he was a threat to the establishment, particularly because he says, there is a kingdom coming. <laughs> and that's what the Romans were scared of. The Romans mis they, they misinterpreted what he meant. And they, because he said, you destroy this kingdom. And in three days, I'll build it again. The confusion that he lived in and the tension that he lived in is what cultural intelligence is all about. We don't destroy that which is, but we learn to accommodate and to understand it. And Jesus did that very, very, very well. So that's where the kingdom is concerned. And then th this, this tension also comes into into what we deal with with i think the next one should be culture um the kingdom of god is paramount where jesus is concerned and so he he brings about this whole idea of the of, of culture the kingdom of god is paramount of jesus interaction with the cultural context yet it becomes remarkably clear that amid jesus's ruthless focus on in inaugurating the kingdom of god is that equally relentless commitment to do it in this way so that he can in effectuate the, the kingdom. That is the challenge of cultural intelligence. But then we come to uh, race. Jesus always conveys the kingdom in the medium of culture. He, he discussed it in the midst of culture. The gospel should not uncritically take on all the values of a culture, but yet at the same time, it should confront the culture. And so that, and that's what Jesus was, was very good at, at doing. Um, now, the, the temple is the other dialectic that we deal with. The temple, Jesus accepted the temple. Um, the temple caused a lot of trouble. Now, the temple was the, it was the, in the midst of Jerusalem. That's what everybody looked to. But while Jesus embraced the temple, he also protested what was happening in the temple, understanding cultural intelligence. 
Jesus, this is how he embraced it. Jesus regularly went to the temple. He went to the temple all the time. Getting to the temple for Passover is a high priority for him. He th but he threw the, the, the money changers out of the temple when they are corrupting the purpose and he regularly references the temple. So he respected the temple. But yet, at the same time, he protested. Yet Jesus says, I'm going to destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. He protests the idea that God's presence could be regulated by physical space. Jesus was very much against the fact that it is only in the temple that the Spirit of God resides. And Jesus was saying, no, it's much more than that. That dialectic is what we deal with when we go into dealing with cultural intelligence. The, the Torah. You know what the Torah meant to the Jewish people? the law of Moses. Jesus constantly got in trouble because he kept on saying, Moses said unto you this, but I say unto you, that was an affront to the Torah itself. But Tidmore, Jesus was the fulfillment of the Torah. And that we understand the challenge that Jesus had as to what to do with the Torah, respect the Torah, but at the same time, understand quite well that a new day has dawned that's what we do as we deal with people of different cultures you jesus respected the torah but at the same time he was careful to talk about what does it mean that this messiah has come to the world and to be able to express it in such a way that people accept that the land <laughs> was another tension for Jesus. Um, Jesus embraces the, 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 the whole idea of the, the mosaic economy. Land was very important. Some commentators uh, look to the where Jesus talking about render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But by the same token, he was saying that the, the, the whole idea of religion is not about land, but it's about a different kingdom this new kingdom that Jesus Christ has just come to bring. Any questions on this? Any comments? This ain't the only, only thing I wanted to add is that, is that when he, he, uh, when he gave us the two greatest commandments and he summarized the, the, the uh, Ten Commandments, he was telling them, love the Lord and love your neighbor. So he was he, he referenced a lot of times the Old Testament. He even even when he said man doesn't live on bread alone when he was in the wilderness, he spoke from Deuteronomy, I think eight and three. So he spoke to the Old Testament. It, it was not like he wasn't connected to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So therefore, um, and, and this is the challenge for the church today. You cannot embrace the Great Commission until you have embraced the great commandment <laughs> those two things must go hand in hand you cannot really take the gospel to different people until you accept the fact that you have to love your neighbor just like you love yourself and that's difficult it's difficult to love people who are, are different than we are i've gone i've gone to africa and I, one of the challenges is, is, is hygiene. And when we understand that people cannot take their showers as they could and, 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 and all of that. So they have a different hygiene system in some of the little pockets that you go to. But we have to understand where people live, how they live. And understanding that, we will understand how we deal with different people. The Torah. Now, the... The tension about race. Folks who ask the question, why is it that all the disciples were Jews? There are That's some true. who think Jesus, that Jesus was the only one that wasn't a Jew. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Marlene. That's the word, cultural. At the time, that was the culture of the day, of the people. Didn't that encourage 
what Paul said, salvation has come to the Jews. First. And the only reasons why the jet the only reason, according to Paul, while the Gentiles are included, is because the Jews refused Jesus Christ. How do you live with that tension? As to what Jesus did. Did, to, did Paul miss the mark? No. Is salvation really only for the Jews? No. Come on. Then it wouldn't be the nations. Hello? Then it would not be the nations. It's not only for the Jews, but it's for the nations. Go ye into all the world, underline that, and preach right. the gospel. Right. So we live with that tension. Yeah. So, so theological tension. So do we? Have, I, I think that the, when, when we want to look at things from a, 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 a from where we're from, we don't pick where we're born. That's just coincidental. Salvation right. is for everybody who is saved. That again. Did must say that again. I said uh, uh, we don't pick where we're from. That's kind of you just you, you don't pick that, but mm. you can pick what you want to believe. You can pick to follow Jesus. Salvation comes to anyone who believes. You have to just, you have to follow, follow Christ. Not necessarily just because you were born a certain place. And I think when you start getting into trying to divide it by race, yeah, that you, you don't pick that. But right, you can, you right, can choose. Right. He gave us the ability to make that choice. And, and Jesus, we have, you know, right. And Jesus was our example, even though Jesus was a Jew, and his ministry seemed to be centered around the jewish people jesus also taught that salvation has come to all the samaritan woman he he jesus was always breaking down barriers because while there was this whole idea uh, the judeo idea that salvation is for the jews jesus constantly broke down those barriers and it is an example for us to understand what jesus did Jesus protests the idea that Jews should discriminate against or even avoid people from other cultures. Jesus was saying to people, hey, it ain't about your thing. It's about everybody's thing. It's about salvation. And he broke down those barriers. The churches today must learn to break down the barriers and to be able to embrace people of different cultures but the question that 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 Catherine asked um earlier on is is very very significant how then do we do this how then do we embrace the other person by understanding uh their culture we are almost all here where is dawn Now, who is from Nigeria? Yeah. Who is? Who is? Samson Juba. Juba. Samson Juba. Okay. That's okay. me. All right. Um, Sorry. Just... Uh, excuse me. Please, just you have to excuse me. I won't be able to put my video on because I'm a, uh, I'm on call duty, attending to right. patients. All so right. I'm with you. Hey, yes. don't shoot! Don't shoot nobody. No, I'm not gonna. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I'm a radiographer. I have to shoot. <laughs> uh, Justin, to shoot just, tell us. just tell us about yourself. Okay. <laughs> Justin, tell us about yourself. Unmute. Yeah. Oh yes, I've I've already done so. I am the police officer. Oh, no, who just joined us? Gary. Gary. Yeah, Gary just joined us, right? Gary, tell us about yourself. All right. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Blessings. Um, I'm I know a that guy. Guy, so. Yeah, I know that guy, too. <laughs> I must apologize for being late. Uh, tonight was all Bible study. Yeah. But I, I am Gary Devlish from St. Vincent, mm -hmm. you know, Iruna, the land of the blessed. Come on. You're blessed, you're blessed there, you know? Good. All right. So uh, I love the Lord. Yeah. I want to be effective Good. at at solving him, you know? Good. And you know, this this tonight, this this course in you know, the cultural, you know, yeah. Studying it, it it's it adds to 
to that um, tool set mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. being able to effectively solve him yeah. in his kingdom. Good, good. good. All right, um, Catherine, um, you can cue this video up. This is a video that I did. Um, I look much younger in this video. I did this some um, uh, 10 years ago. But take a look at this video and then we'll talk on the other side. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk a little about um, that which I did at the end. But before I do, I want to ask you a question. What culture do you find most difficult in your life as you encounter people? What is the one culture that you would like to know more about? Beginning with you, Barbara. What what is what culture in your life do 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 ha, as you have encountered different people? What culture would you like to know a little more about to understand? I would like to know more about the Caribbean culture. After Joan came to Dallas and did the concert, that was a life changing moment for me to be able to worship God in a whole nother language which was, I could understand her language, but just to be in a whole different vibe. So I would love to understand that culture a lot more. Good. Marlene? Marlene, what culture would you like to know a little more about? Um, the Indian Chinese. Mm -hmm. It's a wide field for missionary field. It's a wide missionary field, so mm -hmm. I would like to know how to relate. And then, too, I also have a... Growing up in Trinidad, we interacted with those two. Sure, sure, sure. Gary? Ah. Well, the, the two main culture... I would really love to know about is um, what I would call the. I'm thinking from the the standpoint of witnessing mm -hmm. the dance hall culture, uh, the ghetto youth mindset culture, and I, I just yesterday I was looking at um, two young boys and mm -hmm. they were singing to a song that spoke about poverty the, the nastiness in the song the, what really came out was poverty and they were relating to this song because they were uh, from that culture if mm -hmm. you would put it that way yeah, sure, so sure. to really understand and be able to impact that culture yeah mm -hmm. good good anthony um <laughs> Well, for me, I, I would think um, the women culture mm. in, terms, in terms of surviving marriage. <laughs> good, 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 good. So culture is not just race <clears throat> and ethnicity. Culture is gender. Tinmore? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would, would like to learn more about the Islamic faith. And, what? and and Islamic. Islamic faith. Oh yeah, yeah, good. And considering I've, I've been in the Middle East, I would like to. I mean, I spent time there, but I would love to take a deeper dive into mm. wh what they're. I mean, I know they believe a lot of the same things we believe. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of where did, where was the break off and dig a little deeper dive into that. Good, good. John. African American culture sometimes puzzles me. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a lot of African American friends, but every now and again you see something that pops your eyes open, especially as it relates to Christian principles and belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm from a totally different culture. So some things that I would see are just like surprising to me. Good. Yes, it is accepted in their cultures. So yeah. I also wanted to understand and I had this conversation last week I wanted to understand the African culture mm -hmm. from the standpoint of um one man having more than one wife <laughs> um and this man is a pastor mm -hmm. so 
do I resolve that the culture trumps the word of God? Um, so I was with an African friend and um, the saxophonist guy, I remember that guy? And his dad is a pastor. And his dad had like three wives. So for a long time, we're talking and how, how does, how does that fit into the word? And then I asked him if he would, if he would embrace that culture and it was something that it was totally against, but that's how he was raised. Good. So that for me was a very interesting Good. overview. Great, great. Catherine. Well, Joan brought something back to memory for me because there was this African guy and he told me that, um, uh, his first wife would give me permission to marry him. And I said, yeah, but God doesn't. So <laughs> wow. but, um, just wanting to know more in general, um, the Indian culture and the Asian culture, I, I did learn at one point that it was offensive to um, a, a Japanese person or a Chinese person for you to confuse the two. Of mm. course, you know, they didn't understand how you could even get it confused. You know, he's Japanese, I'm Chinese. And, and so um, Asian culture in general, uh, you know, I would like to know more about that because in our area, we have a lot of mm -hmm. um, companies, um, you know, there are a lot of restaurants that, you know, are Asian and there's, there's different, like in the Chinese, there's the Cantonese and then there's other cultures within those cultures. So mm -hmm. Good. that's what interests me. And of course, the Indian culture, the India Indians, because now I am working with them. So I am trying to learn more about their culture. And, and I'll just put this out there just for this group to know that the, the Indians that are a part of the uh, Community Missionary Baptist Church of India I have learned so much about their struggle mm -hmm. that it is it is a struggle uh, um, from their own government for them to be Christians because India, you're you know that's not the major religion there, mm -hmm. and the things that they have to go through to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, uh, Justin. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I would really like to learn about the culture of um, religion, the religious culture, you know. There are so many different types of, of religion, you know. Um, I really like more interested in learning more about the religious culture. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Yeah. Good. Dawn? Uh, I, would, I have a couple of interests. Um, the uh, African culture because I, I have a few friends that are from Nigeria and I have um, a couple of friends from Sierra Leone and it's like, she's like, they're different, you know? And so, um, and we kind of just kind of lump, put them all together because, you know, it's like, okay, this is Africa. So, but they're very different. And um, so I would like to know more about that. And I also had an interest in um, the Asian culture and uh, as well as the Indian culture, like um, Sister Catherine had mentioned, because mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me um, of their 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 struggle and how how it relates to ours when we were you know like the poor, very poor, you know. And um, I was just just really kind of intrigued by that and how they. Um, kind of still deal with it all at this time, at this point in life, you know, because it's not really the same for us um, as it, it was back then, but it seems like it's still, they're still there. And, you know, so I want to know, well, what, what, why is it? And because you see with that, um, that type of, um, with those people, there are some that are way up here, and then there are those that are way down here. You know, where is the, the middle and why is it like that? Good. Good. Samson? Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, my, uh, well, I would like to know about the Islamic culture, like someone has really said. I want to know the reason why someone wants to go uh, to kill people and believe that he will have seven uh, virgins when he get to heaven. 
<laughs> I want to know. I want to know about that. Uh, I want to know about the culture of being uh, being cruel to all other 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 culture. Good. Uh, those are my. Yeah, very good. Um, let me let me just point out to you. There are two words that, if we're going to deal with people of different cultures, there are two words that we need to remember. Number one is stereotype. And number two is generalizations, okay? Stereotype and generalization. Um, because you know of one person in a culture that does something, that does not mean that everybody in that culture does it. So we have to be very careful not to stereotype. The other, on the other side, is the idea of generalization. Because a people do something, we don't say that everybody does it. So those are two things that we have to hold. What Joan mentioned about, and this is very, very important, what Joan mentioned about the struggle in terms of our Christian values is very important. And it is important because, as we said earlier, Christ was able to take the gospel to different people and to meet people where they are but to understand the, the reasons why people do what they do. I was asked many years ago to go to Africa, to Ghana, and to do a conference, and they asked me to go to speak about bigamy. <laughs> uh, these people that have many wives. And my first reaction was, it is not an American problem. Um, they asked me, no, to Kenya. Uh, they asked me to go over there and to talk about why people should have one wife. And, and I hesitated. And I hesitated for this reason. It is not an American problem. However, Enoch Letsweli said something to me one day. He says, you know, the difference between Africa and America is that we have many wives at the same time. In America, you have many wives, but you have one after the other. You divorce one, and you marry another, and you divorce. How many, how many friends we know that have had, been married three times, four times, five times? One friend, one friend of mine is married seven times. He say, I keep doing it until I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, I, I, and I went there. And when I went, the conversation was a sociological conversation in that we know that there are more women than men. We know that. How does a society deal with that? What, what, how should women accommodate the very fact that they are, they are not enough? Men? So there are so many women in cultures that should women decide, well, you know, um, I'm going to have to share my man because it's more women than men. How does a culture deal with it? I was asked a, another question as to, in America, we have social security. That's a great system. In old age, we know that we have social security. How do a people in villages in Africa deal with old age? They have a way to deal with it. They say just have a lot of children have as many boy children. Children in Africa means, uh, has a different meaning than children in America. They, that's their social security. So you get many wives and you are able to do. So understanding why people do certain things, I think is very, is very critical. So the struggle, however, is to hold in tension our Christian, quote unquote, our Christian values. Um, that how do we how do we keep those christian values let me talk about some values that you have in cultures and if we don't understand these values we will always get in trouble and these are tensions that you have the first is clock time make sure you write this down clock time versus event time okay some cultures are very, very clock conscious. America is a time conscious country. 
Ford when he invented, you know, in Ford um, factories, you know, in America, you hear time is money. So people are always conscious about time. Whereas there are other cultures that are event oriented. The event is more important than the clock. So let me ask the question. As you know, as you have studied the life of Jesus, was Jesus a clock-oriented person or an event-oriented person? Event. What would you say? Event. Mm -hmm. Who is that, Tidmore? Event? Yes, I agree. Explain that, Tidmore. Well, I'm going to go back to, uh, he had a short life. He was called a lamb. Lambs mature in a year and a half. So that's one of the reasons why he was called a lamb. And life expectancy for him was not going to be that long. It was more important for him. To, and, and a lot of the things when he encountered you, he was immediately, he didn't take his time in performing a miracle. It was normally done immediately with his words. He said, get up, take your mat, give me your hand. His, his, his actions were immediate. When he fed you, it wasn't about a, 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 a coordination. It was immediate action. So his, his, his concept of time was making it happen, but it happened be, in a sense of urgency, but he wasn't in a hurry. So Good. just looking at the okay. whole, his, his life, his ministry, and how, and how he did things, it was immediate. He didn't think like about the event forecasting was... the storm, telling you right. about the storm. He just said... So the event was stop. more important than... Right. The... Okay, good. Right. Anybody else? Right. I agree with it more, but also I yeah. Explain that, Joan. And I said I was I I was thinking the way Tidmore thought, but also, um. So I've had this conversation ever so often with my Seventh Day friends, and I, and I say that because their sun sunset to their sundown was it sunrise to sunset is very important to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was in a discussion the other day with a whole bunch of my friends, and we were talking about this, this, this Seventh-day Adventist culture. But I'm not here to say that they are not saved, but I find that, I remember one Saturday I was invited to sing at a church in Pennsylvania, and I got there, and I, and I really, really wanted a cup of tea. So I said to, must be this hospitality lady, can I have something warm? And she says, um, she can't give me something warm because they can't light the fire. On the Saturday. So I said, if Jesus was here and somebody's fainting and it's just a cup of tea that Jesus, Jesus is going to stop and ensure that they get the tea, right? Mm -hmm. So when you talked about clock time versus event time, back to Tidmore's point is that Jesus never refused to do anything. And when he wanted to do it, it's done. He called it into action and it was performed. But I think that we have not embraced that in America because we are this clock-oriented, time-oriented country. And I think it robs us a lot in terms of getting to the heart of who Jesus has called us to be mm -hmm. because we are around the clock time. Good. So Jesus was eventful. Everything he did was, was an event. It was about the event, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else on this clock time versus event time? Um, I think that there were, I, I personally think uh, event, I agree with that as a whole, but I think there are some areas where Jesus went by the clock. Um, at the marriage ceremony, he told his mother, now is not my time. This part of time is not when I'm supposed to do something. Mm -hmm. And then when he was getting closer to where he was going to die on the cross, then he says, now is my time. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with the event, but it had to do with the clock too, because Certain things I'm not going to do before it's time for me to do them. I'm going to do them at the appropriate time. Yeah, yeah. So these values, um, as, we, as we study culture, we, we must understand that there are certain cultures that are clock-oriented. And there are certain cultures that are event-oriented. Uh, in most third world countries, they are event-oriented and not clock oriented. And so as, as we, of course, the fact about Jesus is that if Jesus is going somewhere, the event 
was more important than getting there so if he's on his way to heal somebody then something happened and somebody says hey heal my son jesus will stop and jesus will will do we, we know the story well about lazarus how lazarus died so this understanding of a people for instance a, a certain people who have to depend on buses or public transportation and it is always late there are parts of africa for instance where and, and latin america where people if you get if you get clock oriented you're going to be in a lot of trouble you get frustrated because it's always late we have to understand as we deal with people from different cultures caribbean people are event oriented we know that um we don't go by the clock uh, one of the one of the, the the differences i noticed when i was in new york um when i first came to this country and I, I would see a video of people on, on, in the morning and everybody is rushing, going to the subway. They are rushing, going to the subway. Everybody is just rushing. <laughs> and then I go back to Trinidad, nine o'clock in the morning, and people are just walking. They're going to work and they're taking their time and they walk because that's the way we are. We are an event. We, we, when we get to work, we get to work. But however, when those two cultures clash, how do we negotiate how do we negotiate when cultures are so different and for instance in third world churches in america they when does the service over the service is over when the service is over <laughs> whenever god appears but in america we are very clock conscious and time oriented and we if we are going to reach people of a different culture we have to understand the values that they hold dear to them N not understanding the values of uh, let's let's bring another value is what is called power distance um there are some cultures that when you talk about the power distance in terms of respect for elders uh in in for instance the hierarchical system where there is great respect for uh, let me give you an example an american went to mexico and with a plant in mexico he went to work there and one of the things that he told um the, the people he told some of the supervisors i want you to make sure that you go to lunch with all the people that work under you take them to lunch and and all of that because that's what you do in america america is that kind of system where it's flat there is not a power distance now he told the the the, the supervisor in mexico i want you to go to and of course the mexican wouldn't do it because in that culture it's a hierarchical system so bosses don't go to lunch with people under them or uh, under the other so that it creates a, a real problem when you have to when these two cultures clash we have to that's very important there are cultures who come to america for instance and where people are called by their first name that's something that you see i I'm, my case is in point i don't like anybody to address me as doctor so and so and i i've had problems all my life i don't i don't even want people to call me reverend um i'm oliver and i, I that i break that hierarchical system but how do we deal with people uh, from different cultures if we don't understand why they do certain things another polarity is high versus low uncertainty avoidance some cultures take more risks than other cultures jamaica for instance is the most risk-taking people in the western hemisphere and that has been certified jamaicans take more risks as a people they will take risks much more than any other island in the caribbean <laughs> they they are risky people in other words they will take a chance other cultures they want to know uh no one two three what happens after this and why you think jamaica has a bobsled team only in jamaica would you have a bobsled team because they would take risk in other words take a chance 
for something to happen they will take a risk and people we have to deal with people who are risk averse um many times in a board meeting i i have people in board meetings who are risk averse and they hold the entire church back because they want to know why are you doing this and they, you must be able to tell them well one two three and if it fails this so as we understand culture we must be able to understand the values that they hold dear and if we don't understand the values then we are in a lot of trouble let me um any questions here about how we accommodate cultures well, who, it was, who it was that had a problem with having many wives <laughs> I know. good night good night Chuba. yeah this is juba yeah uh, just, uh, i thank you very much for your for your word and for your for your lecture yeah, I actually wanted to find uh, make a correction from what I've heard from uh, my colleagues tonight mm -hmm. concerning Nigeria, pastor man many wives and uh, concerning yeah. a man who said his wife giving permit giving permission to marry another wife. Mm -hmm. That one is a it's a, it's a fallacy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a blunt and like, but you have mentioned it that like you talk about stereotype and uh, generalization. Yes, uh, the fact yes. that one individual did it does not mean that it's generalized come on you know most of these are uh, people most of these are uh, most of us who travel abroad because they are we are crazy to get the, the the citizenship of a country you want to tell lies that we make you stable so if you meet any lady that you want to marry even when your wife is still in nigeria you still have to tell lies which i've been uh, i've been championing this course that nobody should tell lies and get married but it's not a good thing Mm -hmm. so it doesn't bring nah, it doesn't bring, it doesn't bring peace to anybody yeah. so is that been going like is that light that been going on no wife no nigerian woman will allow you to marry another woman take that mm -hmm. now if any man tells you that is a lie <laughs> yeah okay no right. nigerian woman generally it's not the nature of every woman to allow some the second wife to come into the house that he has built she has built no 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 that's no <laughs> that's that one if they're telling you that they want to take your money, some of them will even call the wife. They can even negotiate with their wife all because they want to get something from that you as a foreigner. That's, please establish that. Then number two, the second one, we're talking about the pastor who said he is a Christian and he married. No, it depends on the kind of, uh, let me say, the kind of uh, what religion is he from. A Pentecostal pastor, we never allow that. We don't allow it as a Pentecostal pastor is one man, one wife. In fact, it's so bad in Nigeria that even if you have divorced before, it's hard for, for, for you to marry as a Pentecost pastor. It's hard for you to be a pastor. They might not recognize you as a pastor, even when you have anointing. Mm -hmm. we, we are we so we so uh, we so tough on that. And then some of some we have some religions. They are not Pentecostal. They believe that they can have. They're still taking uh, on the Old Testament David uh, Davidic uh, uh, life. Or Abrahamic life, they still believe in that. We call them the CNS, the Kirby and the White Garment Church. Mm -hmm. They take that, but some of them are even erasing it now because it's a trouble. Uh, polygamy is a trouble home. I won't lie to you. It's a war torn home. So we no, we don't want to take it. Right. We are not taking it. Yeah. So if anybody comes out of the country and say Nigeria did that, no, no, it's not Nigeria. It's, it's a, so the challenge is that of stereotypes and generalizations. It's, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Let me let me let me um, tell you the four and, and let me introduce the four quadrants that I think that would be important. Anthony, you you wanted to say something? Okay, good. Um, let me give you the four quadrants because this we will elaborate on as we go through the course. Um, CQ drive. CQ, and of course, you know, we are using CQ to mean cultural intelligence. So there is CQ drive. There is CQ knowledge. There is <coughs> CQ action, a strategy, and CQ action. Okay. Those are what, so as you begin to think of the paper that you're going to be writing, these are the four the four quadrants 
of becoming culturally intelligent. CQ drive, CQ knowledge, CQ strategy, and CQ action. Let me deal with the first. You cannot become culturally intelligent without motivation. Yeah. Because becoming culturally intelligent is a difficult process. So you always have to ask yourself, why? Why do I want to do this? Why do I want to understand the Hispanic person? Why do I want to understand other cultures? This is the first question that you must come to terms with. Your motivation for wanting to become. And we have to constantly check that. Well, let me throw out the motivation. The motivation for becoming culturally intelligent is that you have a mandate to reach other people. I don't like the term win other people. And it's an evangelical term that we like to use that we are going to win other people to Christ. When you use that language of winning other people, you are establishing a, a win-lose situation or you are in a war. So therefore, you are about, you want to change the other person. When the underlying motive is to change the other person, immediately you set up a wall. Let me introduce another word that, that I think is more palatable. You are not trying to win the other person, but you are trying to reach the other person. When you use that language, it means that you are trying to get to that person and accepting them as they are on their journey. So that individuals, every individual you meet, they are either on a journey away from Christ, they are going away from Christ, or they are coming to Christ. And we meet them where they are and we understand the values that they hold dear. If we understand that and we respect the values that they have, we can reach them where they are. And they, if we want to use the term conversion, understand quite well, if you don't meet people where they are, you're going to be in for a fight. Accept the person just like they are and accept the whole concept of the iceberg. Because what you see in an individual is the behavior not their values we must respect the values that because the values that people hold is an accumulated structure over centuries over years over decades that's why they are how they are and to respect that and the motivation for reaching the other person is grounded in wanting to know why people do what they do. Uh, any question on this? The motiv motivation that you want to reach them and that you want to be obedient to the commandment that we have to reach all people with the gospel. Right. And if we are driven by changing the person. We, will, we, we are establishing a, a win-lose situation. Meet people where they are not the way you would like them to be. And it's, you know, um, because people have accumulated values. And the accumulation of values is very strong. And you cannot move people from that unless you understand why they are the way they are. Right. <clears throat> the cultural background to people. Um, the second is CQ knowledge. And so therefore, 
if you're going to reach another people of another culture you must study why people do what they do um generationally um somebody mentioned uh, uh gary you mentioned uh the hip-hop generation and all that um we can only reach them if we understand what are the songs they have heard all their life what kind of home they have come from what have they seen their parents do all their life their grandparents what because we when we talk about culture we're not only talking about ethnic culture we're talking about generational culture mm -hmm. one of the challenges in the church is that us older people don't understand them younger people we we, we don't and we don't give the younger generation a chance because we don't trust them and we don't understand the values that they have lived with, that they have grown up with. What are they hearing every day? Because you have come with your Christian value, <laughs> but you don't understand what that person has lived all through their life. When people come into our churches, we must ask ourselves, where did they come from? Mm -hmm. What has happened in their life? And don't be too quick to judge them because you don't know. <laughs> I know um, Barbara uh, uh, has, has spent a lot of time in, in, in um, spousal abuse and all this, this type of thing. They, they are women who come into our churches and they have gone through so much. And that's that's cultural intelligence to understand what women have gone through in their own life and the only way you can reach them is to respect what has happened how do we do that seek your knowledge study the other person study their background study their history so when you take a whole culture of, of people you know our challenge over at our community missionary baptist church is we are beginning a, an immigration program and i'm starting an immigration resource center and i know what's going to happen we're going to have people from different cultures coming uh, for immigration purposes and some of them will want to be a part of the church unless the congregation understands people of a different culture these people are going to have a hard time and we will not accept them because it's a different culture. We must study the culture. That's CQ knowledge. So first of all, there's CQ drive. What is the motivation? And I know Joan. Joan is, 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 uh, uh, Joan is so passionate about reaching people for Christ. And, and Joan, Joan will do everything she could because the motive Joan can't, Joan, Joan, Joan is like, you know, people sinning, people running a lot. Joan wants to reach them. I know that. That's the, the, the bottom of her heart. However, in doing that, we have to study why people do what they do. It's a fundamental premise in terms of evangelism. Appreciating people, and I have always said in my church, we will we welcome everybody just like you are not the way we would like you to be and in cultures as we 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 think about different cultures we must understand why people live the way they live why why is it that hispanics are that way why is it that koreans are that way i went to um the philippines uh, and one of the great experiences for me was to eat dog and it was so delicious wow. and <laughs> not that i didn't know it was dog i knew it was dog and i sat there and um uh, one of the guys one of the preacher guys told me uh, asked me whether i ever ate dog and i said no i never ate dog and and I, I i put my foot in my mouth i told him the only reason i never ate dog is because i nobody offered me dog and i saw the smile on his face 
<laughs> and two nights after that, they, they got a nice bowl of meat. And I sat and I, I saw everybody just looking at me to see if I'm, I'm the foreign, I'm the American. And everybody's looking, all right, let's see. Let's see what he's going to do. If I did not, when I ate the dog, I took three pieces and put it on my plate. And when I put it on my plate and I took the first bite and I looked around, I saw everybody nodding in approval. Yeah, he's, he's cool. Because I had to understand the culture. If I condemn the culture, if I condemn them for eating dog, then I can't reach them. So they, you have to understand and you have to learn what people do. Why people do what they do. And I got back into the States and I, I, I sent out a little thing and I told people, boy, I had dog and it was so great. And people were writing me all kinds of stuff. And I took a lobster and I cut the lobster open and I took a picture of the open lobster and I said, you eat that? <laughs> Looks like a dinosaur. Looks like something from another age. But to understand people and to accept people the way they are is the only way we can reach them. Cultural intelligence is yes. about reaching people right where they are. And the only way we can do that is by learning why people do what they do yes. any question on this one seek your knowledge so then the third is cq strategy when you get the cq drive right and you get the accumulation and and we in our, our other lessons we'll learn we'll break these down uh, for you i'm just introducing these the cq strategy is what catherine talked about earlier when you have your motivation right and when you have studied then you develop a strategy how many of you did the assessment any anybody did the assessment Don't I did you? it. I did it. Uh, how, how you did, Bob? I did it. How you did? Terrible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you Don, know, I hadn't looked at my grade. Uh, all right. Don, how you did? Terrible. Oh, my gosh. Mm. And some of those in the class uh, don't have the assessment yet. Um, okay. I've got to talk to you about that and how you want me to load it up. Yeah. So there yeah. are people who... Uh, there's a workshop Saturday, and so they, yeah. they got the assessment. So you guys in the class will get that. Good, okay. good, good. You're yeah, not that, having that, this that, class that, virtually, right? Huh? The class on Saturday will not be virtual. No. Yeah. No, that's just a one-day workshop for the local. That's your culture out there in Texas. That's your yes. culture. <laughs> <laughs> good. That's <Okay>. culture. <laughs> the, the workshop is going to be an exciting workshop. Uh, well, CNBC uh, needs a cultural intelligence training for the virtual. Yes, all right, talk to us. You preach, preaching to us. Joan, let me let me explain. If your friend didn't move around the room, we could do it virtually, but I can't keep up with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, but but we we gonna we gonna make sure we gonna uh, uh, make sure that you you we we're gonna record it or something. We'll we'll get to that. But it, taking the assessment is, 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 a, is a great assessment. At least it tells you where you are. Now, um, I, I have fought against using the term evaluation. It's not an evaluation. It's an assessment to tell you where you are and how you can uh, improve that. So after you get your C CQ drive, the motivation, and understand the motivation is the great commission and the great commandment put together. The knowledge, you have to take time to study people, to study their history, to study their background. Um, it's fundamental to evangelism. You cannot evangelize a people if you don't take the time to study them. It makes sense. You must study them. Study why they do what they do. Let me give you an example. A visitor from America went to Korea and he was in a hotel and he noticed after he packed his thing in the hotel, the next 
day he went out in the conference and he came back and they had moved all his stuff from one room and put it in another room he didn't he didn't he couldn't understand why they did that and he noticed the next morning he went to some conferences and he came back and again they moved all his stuff from that room into another room he couldn't take it so he went down to ask why and the explanation and, and and this is a cultural thing the explanation was we oversold and what we do we when we all in that kind of situation we have to move people from one room into another room and what we do is we move the people who we know well we are friends with and and so in other words they consider him to be one of them so that's why they moved him if you didn't understand the culture then you wouldn't understand that so every culture has their little idiosyncrasies that uh some of you weren't some of you weren't here when i mentioned earlier where the guy went and the chief and the, the girl went to the to, to, to a part of africa and the, the griot or the chief spit in his hand and put it on the forehead of the, right. the 12 year old boy well that's a custom why do people why I, I know in Korea and some of the Asian countries, you have to know how to bow, how to shake hand, how do how how far how far down do you go? You're right. And so you study that because you if you don't study that, you you become an affront to people in the midst of their own culture. When you get your motivation right and you get your knowledge right then you develop a strategy for how you're going to deal with people so the reason i ask you about the assessment is that there is a question on the assessment and it, it, it is phrased different ways yes when you go to a group of people who are of a different culture do you plan how you go or do you act spontaneously I ask that of you. When, you. when you know that you're going to meet a people of a different culture, do you plan ahead of time or do you go with them and just spontaneously act? How do you do? Tidmo. I remember answering that question. And I particularly, yeah. because if I don't know, I like to study or investigate to see what I'm what am I get in, getting into? So mm -hmm. for me, I remember that question. I love the whole assessment. I answered, I would plan because I would need to study a little bit to see what I'm getting into just so I would not offend anyone. I used to work for Nissan Motor Acceptance and Matsit, uh, we had a Chinese president and when he came, it, konnichiwa means hello and konnichiwa means goodbye. Mm -hmm. So when he came, he only came to a certain people, which was us because we were in a different department and we had to know how to, you know, say konnichiwa when yeah. we spoke to him and also say konnichiwa when he left, because if we didn't, it would be disrespectful. Yeah. However, if we didn't ask the question on, well, how should we treat him? I'm not Japanese, I'm not Chinese, but they come in, They you need to know, or at least have some type of clue. You develop a strategy. You, you develop a strategy. Yes. Right. Um, Tidmo, you were getting ready to say something. Yeah, what I normally do is I'm a very inquisitive person. I try to prepare myself as much as I can, particularly when traveling, but also because they're an individual, I try to ask them their point of view as well. I'm not shy to ask. I don't make the assumption, but I'm not shy to ask and go along to get their personal point of view because you just can't assume. You just okay. have to be okay to ask. Okay. So I develop a strategy as I go along and ask. Good. So therefore, let me ask again. When you go to a people of a different culture, do you dress like them? Or do you dress the way you always dress? 
that that all depends on how you're prepared prior to going okay so it's good to know what what is expected yeah um you, you just have to ask that question beforehand so you know what to expect it because it may be a norm that may be not of their culture it may be whatever is accepted wherever you are okay let me ask the other so, question the driving question would you eat do you eat the food from a dip the people from a different culture are you comfortable eating their food is that a challenge for you no it's not okay anybody is that is that a challenge not for me. I travel and I just eat what's provided. I pray that God yeah. takes out everything that's there. Even if you have to push your finger <laughs> in your mouth and throw it. No, I traveled once. A... I jumped from a plane to a stage and I was very hungry. I had a headache. And I had to take this painkiller before I sang. And when I was finished, the guys in the band came, knock on my door and say, Hi, Sister Froggy. I was like, Sister Froggy? <laughs> <laughs> they told me I just ate frog. But if they did not tell me, I would not know it was frog. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's their food. They're not dying. I like different foods. I like I don't like to eat the regular food. So if I travel, I'm gonna eat something different I've never had before. And so therefore, strategy is very important. We how we must know before especially if, a, if the persons of a different culture we must plan how we're going to do we must plan how if you're going to excuse yourself plan how to do it because you could offend you offend other people let's take the native americans for instance um i i attended a meeting with a lot of ministers about 20 ministers and one of those ministers happened to be a native american mm an ordained minister as a native american and as we were having our devotions he pulled out a pipe and lit the pipe yep. it's a pink pipe it's not yep. something that he's smoking it's right. a pink pipe right. and you know and he started to go around the room and every you know as he went from person to person they would just take the smoke and yep. you know it's a it's a part of a, their, their custom yes and I was so offended when I saw some ministers, when he went to them, they just backed off. Wow. It was an insult to him. Yeah. This is their custom. He was a minister. He was a Christian minister, but this is part of their Indian culture, yes. their Native American culture. And some of that remains with them. What do you do? How do you strategize? I, I was with the Samoans, um, and let me give you this. This is a, an example of what you, you do. I went to do a revival, and the Samoans, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm preaching for them. I'm supposed to preach at 7 o'clock, and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they are having something, and they says, Dr. Phillips, you will come at 7 o'clock. But we are having something at four o'clock, but don't come, you know. So they told me don't come about three times. So <laughs> inquisitive me, I said, you know what, I'm going. <laughs> I, I went there and I saw about 12 ministers sitting on the floor. Tidmore, you would like this. They are sitting on the floor with their legs, with, you know how you, you sit with your legs crossed. Well, yeah, I, 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 you know, I tried. And I know it will be difficult getting up. But I saw them, and I saw them dressed in their native attire. The guys have some kind of skirt on. They are all ministers in the Church of the Nazarene. And I saw them there. And when I looked, they were sitting in a horseshoe. And I looked, and in the middle was a young lady with what is a basin, a basin, yeah, a basin with water. And when I looked, what she was doing, she was dipping something like a ball, a net ball, a, a, something that was sewed together like a small pillow. And she's taking it and she's putting her hand down in the water and then she will squeeze it and put it down in the water and she will squeeze it and put it down. And all the ministers there around there talking. And then finally somebody got up and they took a cup and they dipped it in the water that I saw this girl playing with. They dipped it in the water and they brought it to me. 
what I didn't know what to do. I, I'm sitting now and I suspect that I'm supposed to drink it, <laughs> but I'm, I, I see her hands in the water and she's just taking it up and down. And I just looked, played stupid and dumb and I just looked and, and then the guy just went to somebody else and he gave it to them. They said a prayer and they drank. He went to two other people and then he finally came to me. <laughs> so what am I going to do? These are all ministers. These are all Christian ministers. But he finally came to me with a cup. And I saw other people drinking the cup and they left a little juta in the cup. You know, okay. drink on them. <laughs> and, yeah, they yeah. Go <laughs> and, and here I am. And they finally brought it to me and I said, Lord, help me now, Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, I, and I drank it. The nastiest thing that, it, you know, it's, it's, however, I asked them after, I, I said, what's in the water? Why, why are you all drinking this stuff? It's the roots of trees, the roots and, and leaves of trees that they put in that little pocket and they would dip in it. And historically, it, it, it brings healing to their bodies, wow. even though they were, the, were Christian ministers historically that's what they do now in developing the strategy uh, Catherine is that you must know what do you do when you are faced with a situation like that yeah you're not going so to that, where, was, where was your drive the drive is where that was I, your drive my drive was that I went there to teach I went there to, no, no, to, I know, but I'm saying in that little, they told you not to come, but yeah, you went because you wanted to be noticed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I wanted to be a part of them. I, I just wanted to know, the, you know, I wanted to know the culture. And then when I looked, I, I, I looked, I'm supposed to preach the night. And of course, they were glad that I drank. When, when I drank, they were like, wow, you are one of us. But, I, but, but they're not talking a language I can understand. But I knew I'm speaking, I'm doing a revival. I'm speaking. I wanted to know the culture. I wanted to know what these people, these people do. And then I looked and there's a, a pig that they take the whole pig and put it under underground and put the fire over it. And that's the pig that I was going to eat that night. That's the pork I was going to eat. But if we, this, the strategy for me is, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to understand the culture. They're not going to kill me. <laughs> but I, they accept me because I don't consider anything they do to be taboo. And that's critical. And that's why it's, it's important to have CQ knowledge, to study your people. But the CQ, coming back to you, Joan, on the CQ drive is that I'm motivated to understand other people. I cannot reach other people if I don't understand why they do what they do. It's critical. And out of that, you develop a strategy. So I'm just asking. Um, that's a lot for the church to embrace. Sure. Yet it is very, very important for the church to embrace. Because if we're commissioned to go, how do we go when we don't even understand the value of understanding another culture mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so how do how do how do you teach a church how do you teach the church to, to, to embrace cultures like that because i mean you wanted to know you had a drive you you, yeah, you, yeah, you wanted yeah. to know the culture and you were deliberate about it mm -hmm. but i think that this is kind of hard to bring across to the wider yeah, sure, church sure 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 and and but, but however the more we study a culture is the more we appreciate why they do absolutely. what they do. Yep. Real, real quick right. story. I, I went to a restaurant that was owned by a blind man in Vegas and it's literally dark. So real quick, by going through that experience, it, it's not like turning out lights. You can't see anything. I have a better appreciation of eating vegan food. Actually, you don't know what you're eating until you finish eating. But now I have an appreciation for somebody who was blind. They, I, what they experience, they don't know what they eat until they go into their mouth. So they have to trust the person that's feeding. 
So mm -hmm. even if you have a blind uh, a parishioner, you can understand what their lifestyle is like. And and to and, and it's only by CQ knowledge. It's we study other people why they do what they do, why people act the way they act, and to appreciate them and to meet them where they are. We know that we have to draw the line somewhere. Now, we always have to draw the line. Um, if we are confronted with some cultural thing that we know that um, is against our religion or against who we are, we have to know how to do it gracefully. Grace. So would you say inclusive, have them inclusive? Yes. And them into, or, you know, the people of the higher ranks. Yes. Ask yes. how to do what they do. And then we can then build a strategy as to how to approach them. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. So the final one is CQ action. And we, we'll develop all of these um, later on. CQ drive, CQ knowledge, CQ strategy, and then CQ action. How do you act after you have developed a strategy for people, reaching people of a different culture? But the bottom line is the motivation. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is I want to reach that person. And... <laughs> And, you know, as we talk about, about culture, just remember, we have a, a very, a very um, present and relevant cultural shift. And that's the LGBTQ community. How do we reach that community? How do we respect people of a different culture? How do we approach people who read the bible differently than we do right how do we deal with the way we interpret scripture and the way other people interpret scripture how do we talk to a group of people who understand quite well that the bible has been misrepresented the whole concept of slavery we see slavery in the Bible and we, we read the book of Philemon and we understand what one of the most controversial books is the book of Philemon. But how do we approach that? How do we approach people who read the Bible differently? Right. How do we accommodate them? Because I think we have to reach people at any cost. And sometimes we have to take our own values and put it in our pocket so that we can reach the other person. Right. <laughs> I agree. That's the task. And Joan, that's the motivation. I'm going to reach people at any cost. I love dealing with people from different cultures. Wherever I go, I, I, you know, I see, I hear an accent. I ask people immediately, where are you from? What's your background? Because as I know... It's your culture, doctor. It's huh? what's your culture. Yeah, the yeah. New lingo is what's your culture. What's your <laughs> culture. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's important. It's important to me. I Because I cannot reach people if I don't understand their background. Right. If I don't understand why they do what, and this is what we will be doing in this class. How do we become culturally intelligent? Because the motive has to be right. The drive. I want to reach other people. I want to be obedient to scriptures. Yep. Yes. That's it. That's it. But I also think that the way that you are socially inclined plays a big deal yeah because you have to you have to love people mm -hmm. right that's true yeah. in that order to so interact true. with them and understand them so you know that's that plays a key role i believe in mm -hmm. you wanting to understand another culture um you cannot be an introvert mindset mm -hmm. going out on that limb yeah you want to understand so 
and, and look forward to learning, man. I, I like and, 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 and understand. I think the bottom line in cultural intelligence is to understand that God is God of everybody. God will surprise you as to where God is working. Oof. We sometimes think that we are taking the gospel to somebody, but God is already there working. Your job is to join God where God is already working. That's good. I tell missionaries that all the time. You're not taking the gospel anywhere. Go and find out where God is working because God is this supreme God is already working in so many people's lives. And, and you know, a, a tip, a, a, yeah, we got to go in a little while. A typical example is oh, the, approach, the approach you, you take with individuals. When you hear somebody's story, it's better to tell them how close they are to Christ than yeah. to tell them how far they are from Christ. Yes. 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 Not how, <laughs> you know, you hear a story and you are able to say, you are this close to the kingdom. This yeah. close. Not yeah. how far you are. But you are so, this close. In spite of your cultural background, yeah. God is already working in your life. Yeah. And I want to join you on that journey. Yeah. So, Doc, I, it's safe to say, therefore, that cultural intelligence resides in our hearts as well as in That's our... That's where it starts. Yeah, yeah, in our hearts. That's right. The, wow. the, love, the love of the other person. Indiscriminate love. Yes, sir. If, if you love the other person and understand that God is already working in their life. Yes. And to say that I'm joining you in this journey to bring you closer to this God rather than telling the person how far they are. Right. From God. Right. That's when we become culturally intelligent. And when we become culturally intelligent, we accept the fact that God is already working Amen. in somebody else's life. Amen. Amen. Catherine, did you take the role? Yes, I did. Oh, you oh God role. bless you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Look, guys, I, I really enjoyed being with you this evening. Uh, is there any other any questions that we may have that that you wow, have. this time just went fast. Um, I'm just excited about this whole course period. And thank you, Dr. Oliver. And Sister oh, Catherine, yeah. she's just a bomb with this internet. So, and I'm glad to see all my classmates. I'm so excited to see Sister Joan. And I can't wait till she come back and do another concert. <laughs> Culture is not mine over there. No, <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> and, and let me challenge you <laughs> as we go through as we go through this class. Good night. Let, Good night, me, challenge you, let me challenge you to think about some individual mm. who you have not been able to reach because you have not understood them mm. and let the lord lay that on your heart that by the time this class is over you would have made a step in reaching that person and it doesn't have to be racially it could be intergenerational but somebody who you didn't understand their culture and that this class has helped you to be sensitive to what is happening in their life and to be respectful yeah. of the journey that they have traveled. That's good. Somebody wants to dismiss us in prayer. I'll go ahead and do it. Yeah. Go ahead. With all my hearts and minds clear, Lord, we thank you for making us better because we were together 
Lord, we thank you for this instruction. And we will go out better people just because of tonight. We will take the challenge given to us to go out and learn something, something new or reach out to somebody we have not been able to reach. Lord, we ask you to bless those participants here as they go to and fro uh, and throughout their week so that we will see them again when we meet again. Lord, we pray to build a fence around the, all the participants here and their families. Lord, we thank you for tonight, and we thank you for mm -hmm. all you've done, all you're going to do, making us better people. Lord, we say a special prayer for our leader of this course, for giving him the wisdom, the knowledge, and understanding to lead us, to make us better people, to serve your people, to reach those who we could not reach, and be better servants of your word, and follow in your footsteps. We thank you for this class. We thank you for our instructor, and we thank you for each other. In your son, Jesus' name, we pray, amen. 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 And look, for those of you who are in the American side, um, you will get the copy of your book on Saturday. Those, uh, Catherine, make sure you have the address, a mailing address for all the people outside of the United States, these guys in the Caribbean, and make sure we ship a copy of that book. The elephant in the Including the, the people that are virtual in America. Make sure we get a copy to join. Look, guys, <laughs> look, guys I, 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 I look forward to this journey that we are going to be on for the next yes. few weeks. And I trust that I you will be a too. better people um, because of this. Good night. Yes. Good night. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.